Welcome back my friends, it's all about Avatar. In this video we continue my wrecking series of all the benders. The people have spoken and y'all pick the non-benders. Like last time in the description you'll find a poll to vote for the next one. Thanks to you guys for some of your suggestions as we still have two options left. That being the animals and the Avatar relationships. So go and vote. Considering the tier list criteria, we'll be evaluating each non-bender based on a combination of skill, power and advantageous abilities. I rank them from the perspective of how good they are in combat. If I haven't seen them in combat enough, then they can't be ranked. Now, an important thing to note is that we have seen some non-benders in giant mecha suits. And I just have to say that this will not be taken account into the ranking because that would throw off the entire balance and it would just be really unfair. So first up, we have not enough non-bending. This is for the non-benders that we haven't seen fight enough in combat for them to be ranked. And again, let it be very clear that this is not the worst tier. They can be legendary fighters canonically, but I won't rank characters based on what we haven't seen. Next up we have Novice, Advanced, Prodigy, Masters and Legendary. Before we start ranking, this video is sponsored by Avatar Generations. Avatar Generations, the Avatar free to play RPG mobile game, is celebrating one year since the initial release with the first annual Avatar Generations Festival, promising huge new features, heroes and event quests throughout the month of August. Across three updates we will get different event quests, and in these event quests, we the players will be able to play self-contained story adventures for a limited time featuring challenging combat encounters and reaping exclusive and powerful rewards. The first event quest that we will be starting out with is the Zuko Alone event quest from the episode, you guessed it, Zuko Alone. In their exile from the Fire Nation, players Ronin Zuko and Trevor Iroh as Zuko seeks his own path during one of the best episodes of Avatar The Last Airbender ever. The Navigator Games team keeps on coming out with these awesome updates for Avatar Generations, guys. Make sure to download Avatar Generations now using the links in the description. And please, let me know what you think of the event quests as I will be playing them as well. Please make sure to subscribe to the channel, it really helps support me and the channel and I really appreciate it. Like the video and comment whether you agree with the ranking. Let's get brawling. Starting out in the not enough non-bending tier, we have 7 non-benders that simply show too little for them to be ranked. Normally I go through them one by one, but because there are so many non-benders that don't really fight enough, I decided to go through them a little bit more quickly. So, first up is Guru Patik. Though being incredibly wise, Guru Patik is not really about getting into fights. Or at least, we never see him do that. Now, if this were spiritual vibes list, he would be in Legendary, but it is not. So, there you go. <laughs> Good one. Moving on. Then we got Varric's assistant, the professional thing doer, Julie. We never see Julie fight, she's more of a tactician and, well, an assistant. I love her character though, she's great. Moving over from Julie, the next character is someone I really don't like, Prince Wu. So we all know Wu is not a fighter, he's more of a crybaby and, well, a very annoying one at that. So there you go Wu. Then we find Hiroshi Sato, and as I said in the intro, I do not really count mecha suits in the ranking because then Hiroshi would be very high on the list, but it makes for a pretty unfair advantage. Besides that, we don't really see Mr. Sato throwing a punch against anyone. He's a brilliant mind though, so there's that. Moving over to Bato from the Water Tribe. Bato's character is kinda lame, and the amount of fighting we see him do reflects that, which is nothing. <laughs> wow, was that too mean? Sorry, Bato. Anyway, I wish they gave Bato something to do in the invasion that would have been very satisfying and would have given his episode in season 1 some more meaning, but they didn't, so here you go, Bato. Here's your placement. Next up is Moon Lady Yue. We do see Yue bend in her moon spirit form, but as a princess in the Northern Water Tribe, she was not accustomed to fight. Actually, she never did. And she probably wasn't even allowed to either. No. Moving over to my man Varric. Varric is a great inventor, a clever mind, but his fighting prowess is far from great. In fact, it doesn't exist. Sorry, Varric, your skills lie elsewhere. The last. Girl! That stays behind in the Not Enough Non Bending tier is Freedom Fighter Smellerby. Although Smellerby got plenty of screen time, she simply did not showcase any fighting. Neither in the Jet episode, nor in the Lake Lauga episode, we don't see her fight at all. Which is a shame, really. With that being said, that was it for the Not Enough Non-Bending tier. And now we go over to the more interesting tiers, starting with Novice. So in the Novice tier, we first have UA's fiancé, Han. Han is so freaking bad. I love his character though, him being so smug and then being made out to be a joke, it works. And I just love the moment when he screams this. Admiral Choi! Prepare to meet your fate! Oh! He did have a physical confrontation with Sokka over UA, and that was alright, it was an okay fight, I guess. 
Sokka did have the upper hand in that little brawl fight, so I'ma give it to Han. The worst placement is for you, my friend. Next up is the weakest link in the team of Freedom Fighters, my man, the Duke. We have pretty much one fight scene of the Duke fighting Fire Nation soldiers who were encamped near the treetop hideout. And there we see the Duke fighting using some interesting techniques involving sitting on Fire Nation soldiers' heads. The Duke's fighting skills are not very good. We do see him come back with his constant companion Pipsqueak during the Day of Black Sun. However, unfortunately, we do not see him perform any fighting feats there, so you get this placement. Moving over to the final contender in the novice tier, we have Boomy. Before acquiring his airbending, Boomy's only fighting ability was with his hands. And we don't see Aang's second son fight that much. I mean, we got this shot of him fighting Gazan using some questionable means. Normally, I always thought pulling someone's hair and biting is off limits in fights, but Boomy doesn't care. He just wants to win. Admittedly, he's still a very, very bad fighter. And then we continue with the advanced tier. And the first group to grace this list are the non benders of the Rough Rhinos. Although Iroh mentioned. Colonel Monkey and the Rough Rhinos are legendary. Each one is a different kind of weapon specialist. Every time we encounter these non benders, they are absolutely clowned. Be it by Iroh and Zuko or by the gang. I mean, there is a threat because the weapons in which they supposedly specialize are quite powerful, ranging from a Guandao spear. Yes, I searched it up. Chains, explosives, and fire arrows, but that threat is always nullified by their lack of feats. Honestly, I wish they would have made them a little bit more capable, because the weapons they use are very interesting. Maybe they are just a better singing group than a fighting group, who knows. Moving over, we have some characters you've probably, or maybe better said hopefully forgotten about. The leaders of the Zhang and the Ganjin tribes. Both characters are shown to be quite capable in the use of the sword. And they are on equal grounds, both in their fighting prowess and in how annoying they are. So I don't rank one of them higher than the other, really. Anyway, there's your annual reminder that the Great Divide episode exists. A far more capable group than the Rough Rhinos are the pirates on the Waterbending Scroll episode. This group of high-risk traders are all very skilled, using smoke bomb explosives to their advantage in fights, and each of them using their own personal weapon in combat. All of them were agile and could evade attacks quite well, and they succeeded in capturing Aang and Sokka using some crazy crossbow net weapon. And of course, let's not forget the pirate captain. He was killed with his sword enough to battle Zuko with it. Though, granted, Zuko was kind of a clown in season 1. I wouldn't say the captain outclassed his fellow pirates, so I do group him in with the other pirates. The final fighter in the advanced tier is none other than Pipsqueak. Being the largest and the strongest member of the Freedom Fighters physically, the name Pipsqueak doesn't really do this giant likable man justice. Pipsqueak's weapon of choice is a huge wooden lock, a weapon wielded with such power that he's able to bend the weapons of his opponents into unusable pieces of junk. It's a shame we don't see him fight much during the invasion. Still though, I'd say he's a very, very scary opponent to face. So that was it for the advanced fighters. Now we enter the Prodigy Tier. And we start at the Prodigy Tier with another group, this time being the Kyoshi Warriors. Excluding Suki though, who is clearly on a different level than her Kyoshi sisters. The Kyoshi Warriors use their war fans to fight, and they turn their opponent's energy against them. Additionally, they were proficient with their shields and katanas. We saw them easily beating Fire Nation soldiers, though at the same time they were outclassed by Season 1 Zuko, which landed them this spot. And having said that about the Kyoshi Warriors, we continue with a Silent Man, and that Silent Man is none other than Longshot. Longshot's exceptional archery skills allowed him to effectively battle Fire Nation troops in their encampment near the treetop hideout. He could disarm multiple soldiers in a matter of seconds, and he even showed more combat prowess in the battle under Lake Laogai. However, he has not shown to have any great mobility, which gives the impression that he's more like a sitting duck in battle. So I'd say one on one he'd probably be not as good of a fighter, but let me know what you think about our Silent Man Longshot guys, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Following Longshot is Sokka's dad, Hakoda. I'm sorry Hakoda, I know it's probably weird for you to be placed lower than your own son, but to be fair you have very few feats. We see Hakoda fight pretty much only during the Day of Black Sun, where our friends and allies invade the Fire Nation. And I mean, yes, he is very capable there, able to fend off several Fire Nation soldiers at the same time using some powerful and smart fighting. However, shortly after that he's taken out by two Fire Nation soldiers in one of the battlement towers, which is what made me decide to put him in Prodigy and not in Masters. All in all, Hakoda is a very skilled and great fighter, but he doesn't rank among the top of them, I'd say. Up next is the weird mole lady, Shirshu riding June. As a professional bounty hunter and an excellent Shirshu rider, June is a force to be reckoned with. However, even without a Shirshu, June is crazy strong, capable of effortlessly defeating a ripped man in an arm wrestling match and throwing him around the bar. In the series finale, we see how June was capable of defeating multiple opponents in a bar fight while throwing her cup she was drinking from the air and catching it before it fell. 
Clearly, she's an exceptional fighting force to be reckoned with, and I'd say she's very, very close to Master. Master Tear! Starting out with the Master Tear, I will probably controversially put Sokka. Now, throughout the series, Sokka's fighting capabilities were kind of a joke, right? He had his occasional boomerang hit, which was nice, but he would never really be able to say that he was better than the fighters we've seen on this list already. It was really only after he trained with Pian Dao, the best swordsman ever known, and after forging his meteor sword, that he really became a master. But still, he's on the low end of mastery. The greatest showcase of his skill is his fight with Pian Dao, where he held his own against Pian Dao. Kind of. I mean, he was probably being tested by him, but... Anyway, we also see him easily take over a Komodo Rhino and disarm his rider. However, besides that, Sokka's combat skills leave a lot to be desired. But let me know in the comments if there's any scene I missed that would point to the contrary. I'm eager to know. Following up is the second in command of the Equalis under Amon, the Lieutenant. Using two electrified Kali sticks, the Lieutenant was an incredibly scary fighter. In battle, he could fend off multiple powerful benders such as Mako and Bolin, and he even held his own for a long time against Korra, ultimately being defeated by the Avatar. In his battles, he showed great determination, being able to take a hit without flinching and coming back with a powerful return. All around, the Lieutenant is a master martial artist, a well-deserved spot here. The next master succeeding, the Lieutenant is a character from The Legend of Korra, Sato's daughter, Asami. Initially, I put Asami a lot higher, but after watching all her feats, I am happy with placing her here. After her father, Hiroshi Sato, enrolled her in the best self-defense classes available, Asami became a highly proficient martial artist, exceptional in hand-to-hand -hand combat. We saw her beating Equalist with great ease and even disarming the lieutenant, knocking him out with his own weapon. And to top it all off, her mobility is amazing. Able to get close to her opponents and at the same time being able to dodge incoming attacks. Asami is an all-around great fighter. And then ladies and gentlemen, we have Mei. Mei was a master markswoman, using shuriken knives and hand arrows to fight from a distance. But unlike Longshot, Mei was not a sitting duck, showing great mobility and innovation. Her accuracy was deadly and she could easily take on benders as her knives would often pin opponents to the ground, even if they were in movement which would thank them from bending. Her power lies in the speed with which she unleashes these weapons towards her opponents as Mei was able to quickly unleash knives and darts from her sleeves but also from her ankles. Of course with such a weapon of choice on Nickelodeon there are some limitations and of course the shots she lands would normally be fatal but are instead show to pin the opponents. Regardless Mei is one scary opponent to face. Next in line, we have the Yu Yan archers, and as Xiao once said, Their precision is legendary. The Yu Yan can pin a fly to a tree from a hundred yards away without killing it. And well, they pretty much proved that. The Yu Yan archers are a group of elite, extraordinary Fire Nation archers. Comparing them to the other archer we find in this list, being Longshot, the Yu Yan archer has one up on the silent freedom fighter. They can fly. Okay, well, not actually, but their agility and aerial mobility is unbelievable. They were able to outmaneuver Aang, which is not a small feat. While jumping from a cliff, they can send their arrows into trees while simultaneously shooting new arrows on their target with incredible precision. Though it is kind of hard to say how good one UAN Archer is, I mean, their accuracy and mobility lends them this spot in the master tier and it is well deserved, I'd say. Moving over, we encounter a skilled strategist and charismatic leader, Jet. Time and time again, Jet displayed masterful skill with his hook swords. Able to defeat Aang in the air and able to fend off a master swordsman like Zuko for a very, very long time. Jet also showed to be creative with his hook swords, interlinking them at times for extra reach and duels. He could take on and take out multiple opponents at once, ranging from Fire Nation soldiers to Daily agents. He was fast, clever and showed mastery over his weapon of choice. Honestly, every time Jet fought, he was simply awesome and Jet gets way too much crap for how cool he is. Throw a justice for Jet in the comments if you agree. As we continue in the last video, I asked you guys if you also wanted me to rank benders who fight besides their bending. And the example I mentioned was none other than the Blue Spirit, aka Zuko. Besides his bending, Zuko developed masterful skill in swordsmanship, specializing in dual wielding swordplay. Like Sokka, Zuko was trained by Master Pian Dao, and he used his dual swords while disguising as the Blue Spirit and while fighting Earth Kingdom soldiers and Zuko alone. Zuko was easily able to defeat multiple Earth Kingdom soldiers and multiple Fire Nation soldiers with little effort. And he even outclassed Jet during their duel before being broken up by the Dai Li. And to top it all off, Zuko even showed to be able to hold his own while unarmed without his dual swords, breaking apart oncoming spirits with his hands and legs and disarming opponents. All in all, Zuko doesn't even need his firebending, he can just grab his swords and go crazy. I'd maybe even go as far as to say that Zuko's swordsmanship outclasses his firebending. What do you think? Well, here we are. In the final tier, the legendary non-benders of the Avatar universe. And we start out with the leader of the Kyoshi Warriors, Suki. To be honest, Suki in Season 1 was kind of underwhelming. Season 3 Suki, now that is a different story. 
Especially in the Boiling Rock 2 parter, we see Suki's incredible hand-to-hand -hand combat prowess and acrobatics. With ease, she climbed an entire building, taking out multiple soldiers and kidnapping the warden on her own. A few scenes later and we see her fighting Tai Li and actually being on par with her. And Suki was also adept at fighting with Kyoshi war fans, fighting with a katana and using a shield. Of course in that scene when they were defending Appa, they ultimately got outclassed and she got defeated by Azula. But, I mean, it's Azula, so what do you expect? Suki is just an incredible martial artist and she deserves a spot in the legendary tier for the incredible feats she's shown. Next up is the last swordsman on this list, the teacher of all the other swordsmen, White Lotus member, Pian Dao. Pian Dao is a legendary swordsman. He was known to have never lost a battle and to have defeated a hundred Fire Nation soldiers after leaving the army just so he could be left in peace. And well, his feats reflect that status. I mean, Pian Dao was extraordinarily agile. While testing Sokka, he was able to move in front of Sokka before Sokka even realized it. Moreover, even while blind, Pian Dao could effortlessly defeat Sokka with his incredible hearing. Later on we see him during the liberation of Ba Sing Se, disarming several soldiers and sliding around the ice slide created by Paku, his fellow White Lotus member. And granted, I wish we saw a bit more of Pian Dao in the finale, which really is a shame. But regardless, Pian Dao was a legendary fighter, teacher, swordsman and White Lotus member, easily deserving this legendary spot. And then, ladies and gentlemen, the final non-bender, the best of all non-benders ever, is Tai Li. Tai Li was beyond this world agile. Often using just her fingers, she could perform the most incredible movements. Her mobility allowed her to evade her opponents, but I mean, not being able to hit her is one thing. Her coming close to benders and chi blocking them, rendering them useless is what makes her the most legendary fighter of all time. That combined with her agility allowed her to comfortably disable Toph, Sokka, Katara, multiple earthbenders at once, Azula and more. Even though opponents that already faced her before at times knew how to avoid her attacks, they still didn't know how to beat her because she would always outmaneuver all of them. There is no doubt in my mind that Tai Li is easily deserving the best spot on this list. But what do you guys think? Do you agree that Tai Li is the best fighter on this list? Would you put Pian Dao above her or even Suki? I'm eager to know. If you want to see Zuko, Suki and other non-benders in action, don't forget to download Avatar Generations now. And let me know what you think of the Zuko alone event quest. Links are in the description. So that was it guys. Thank you so much for watching. Do you agree with my ranking? Who do you think should be higher on the list? Who do you think should be lower on the list? And who did I get just right? I am eager to know your thoughts. Don't forget to like the video and vote for the poll that really helps me out. Subscribe to the channel if you want to join the club and have a good one. See ya.